Kristen Sainani is an associate professor at Stanford University. She teaches statistics and writing, works on statistical projects in sports medicine, and writes about health, science, and statistics for a range of audiences. She authored the Health Column Body News for Allure magazine for over a decade. She is also the statistical editor for the journal Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and she authors a statistics column, Statistically Speaking, for this journal. She teaches the popular Massive Open online course, Writing in the Sciences on Coursera, and she was the recipient of the 2018 Biosciences Award for Excellence in Graduate Teaching at Stanford University. Thanks, Jackie. So uh, today I'm gonna teach a few statistic lessons using examples from the news. And I'm gonna present three case studies for you that illustrate different statistical principles. And I'm gonna start here by talking about how we quantify and describe risk using a recent example related to COVID-19. Um, in just a second here, I'm gonna play a short video clip, and this is from a White House press conference, and the speaker is the FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn. that COVID-19 convalescent plasma is safe and shows promising efficacy, thereby meeting the criteria for an emergency use authorization. In the optimal treatment of the optimal patients as described by Secretary Azar, treated with convalescent plasma at the highest titers, there was a 35% improvement in survival, which is a significant clinical benefit. Now we're waiting for more data. We're going to continue to gather data, but this clearly meets the criteria that we've established for emergency use authorization, and we're very pleased with these results. So let me just put this in perspective. Many of you know I was a cancer doctor before I uh, became FDA commissioner, and a 35% improvement um, in survival is a pretty substantial clinical benefit. What that means is, if, and if the data continue to pan out, 100 people who are sick with COVID-19, 35 would have been saved because of the administration of uh, plasma. We've seen a great deal of demand for this from doctors around the country. Um, and what this EUA does, EUA emergency use authorization today does, it allows us to continue that. Okay, so you heard uh, the FDA commissioner there make two quantitative statements. He said that in patients treated with convalescent plasma at the highest antibody titers, there was a 35% improvement in survival. And then he translates that. He says, what that means is that if you have 100 people sick with COVID-19, you could save 35 of them by the administration of plasma. Um, he's made an error there, actually. And uh, in fact, uh, right after the White House press conference, Statistics Twitter just kind of lit up, pointing out his error. I'm going to walk you through the error because it illustrates a larger statistical principle. So where did that 35% statistic come from? It came from a study that was published as a preprint uh, back in August. And this was an observational study of COVID-19 patients, all of whom were treated with convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma is when you take blood from people who have survived COVID and you give it to people who are sick with COVID, the idea being that you might be giving them antibodies against COVID. There was no control group, um, but the reason they measured the levels of antibodies in the blood samples that the patients received and found that, in fact, um, some people had gotten blood with very high levels of antibodies and some people had gotten blood with much lower levels of antibodies. So they used that low antibody group essentially as the, the outcome was seven day mortality, whether or not you died within seven days of receiving the treatment. And they compared the high antibody group to the low antibody group, and they got a risk ratio of 0.65, indicating a reduction in deaths um, in those who got the high antibody plasma versus those who got the low antibody plasma. So let's actually now uh, just uh, dig into the numbers that they used uh, to calculate that risk ratio. So here I'm showing you the data for seven-day mortality by group, high, medium, or low antibody type. What the authors did is they calculated what we call a relative risk or a risk ratio. So they divided the risk of death in the high antibody group by the risk of death in the low antibody group. 8.9% divided by 13.7%. That gives a risk ratio of 0.65. This was, in fact, marginally statistically significant at the 0.05 level. But how would you translate that in words? 
Well, you could say that in relative terms, this is a 35% improvement in survival. So in fact, the FDA commissioner got that first statement correct. But there's another way that you can present the numbers here. So instead of calculating the relative risk, you can calculate what we call the absolute risk difference. And um, this is where instead of dividing the risks, you're going to subtract them. So 13.7% of the patients in the low antibody group died within seven days versus 8.9% of the patients in the high antibody group. That is an absolute reduction in deaths of 4.8%. Or you could say there were 4.8 or about five fewer deaths per 100 COVID patients. Now notice that's different than what the FDA commissioner said. So the FDA commissioner actually made an error here. He said there were, you would say, 35 people out of 100 when it's actually five. Uh, the error that he made is that he mistakenly interpreted a relative risk as if it was an absolute risk. Um, this just goes to show you that quantitative communication is hard. Even people with lots and lots of training can mess this up when they go to translate math into words. Um, all right, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit more in general about the concepts of absolute versus relative uh, risk. And I think it actually helps to make an analogy here. So I'm teaching my kids about you know, fractions and decimals, and they always find it easier if I put it in money terms. So I'm going to make an analogy here. And imagine uh, my daughter wants to buy a stuffed animal, um, this cute little stuffed blob fish here. And it normally costs $13.70, but it's now on sale for $8.90. So you can ask the question, how much is she saving? And there's two ways to answer that question. You can talk about the absolute amount. She's saving $4.80. Or with money, we often talk in relative terms. So you can also talk about the relative amount here. $8.90 is 65% of $13.70. So she is saving 35% or she's getting 35% off. Now, the relative information is really never enough information. It doesn't give the whole picture, right? Because if you have 35% off of an item that costs $1,000, that's a $350 savings. But if you have 35% off an item that costs $1, that's just a 35 cent savings. So it's important in addition to having the relative amount to also always have information about the absolute amount. Students find it tricky uh, to communicate relative risks in words. So I'm going to go over a few examples now. So for example, if you have a risk ratio of 0.5, that is a halving of risk, or you could say a 50% decrease in risk. If you have a risk ratio of 2, that is a 100% increase in risk. And this always confuses students. They want to say that it's a 200% increase in risk. But again, it helps to make an analogy to money. So imagine you have an item that costs $10 and it increases in price to $20. That is a $10 increase, which is a 100% increase in price, not a 200% increase in price. Um, similarly, a risk ratio of 2.5, that is a 150% increase in risk, not a 250% increase in risk. And as I already alluded to, whole story. It's important to always give information about absolute risks as well. And you know, I have to give the FDA commissioner credit for he was he was trying to give information about absolute risk. He messed up the numbers, but at least he was trying to give that complementary information. Um, and that's because you can see here, if you've got an exposure that increases your risk of disease from 0.01% to 0.02%, that is a risk ratio of two. But you're also getting a risk ratio of two if you're increasing your risk from 10% to 20%. But those are very different cases, right? In the first case, you're increasing your risk from one in 10,000 to two in 10,000. That is a one in 10,000 increase in risk in absolute terms. Uh, in the second case, though, you are increasing your risk in absolute terms by one in 10. Those are very different, even though they have exactly the same risk ratio. All right, the second case study I'm going to present here, I want to teach some concepts in probability as presidential election as an example. So we now have to travel back in time here to 2016 
right before the U.S. presidential election in 2016. And many of you may remember that right before the election, a lot of election forecasters were very confident that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. The Washington Post said the 2016 election is already decided. New York Times gave her an 85% chance to win. The Huffington Post had her at a 98.2%. And in fact, they said Trump has essentially a new path to an electoral college victory. 538.com did a little better. They put her at a 70% chance to win. So they did have a real path you know, for Donald Trump to win, but you know, still a high probability. The Princeton Election Consortium had her at a 99% chance of a win. And in fact, the author of that website, Sam Wang, was so confident that she was going to win that he said if she lost, he would eat a bug on live TV. So he actually had to eat a cricket on CNN. All right. Fast forward now to the year 2020. Uh, we have a presidential election coming up in just two weeks. Um, I knew the election is probably on a lot of your minds. It's certainly on mine. I have already voted. Um, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to present to you uh, an election prediction from 2020 that makes some of the errors that happened in the election forecast in 2016. So this election forecast comes from the Miss Cannon Center website. It's not a website I would normally traffic. Uh, but I happen to have found this example on Twitter. And you can see that I get a lot of my teaching examples from Twitter these days. Um, they put out a prediction in mid-September with a Biden chance of a win at 99.5%. And you can see their, uh, the results of their statistical model over here on the right-hand side of your screen. And so what they are doing is they are modeling the election in terms of electoral college votes for Joe Biden. So that's what's on the x-axis. The y-axis is probability. And so the height of these bars represents the probability of different outcomes in the election in terms of electoral college votes for Joe Biden. Now, let me remind you how the American election system works. So each state, uh, there are a few districts, but primarily each state has a certain number of electoral college votes. Whoever wins the state wins those votes. Um, there are 538 total electoral votes. You need 270 to win. And you can see that all of these bars that are blue, that's where Biden got at least 270 and went, wins the election. There are only a very few cases where uh, Biden gets less than 270 and uh, Trump wins the election. So this puts Biden at a very high chance of a win. <clears throat> Again, where I found this example is I happen to follow Nate Silver on Twitter, and he is the founder of 538.com. And he tweeted about this particular election forecast uh, a few weeks ago. And he says, I can't believe after 2016 that people are still modeling the Electoral College as though each state is independent and giving Biden a 99.5% chance of victory. State polling errors are highly correlated. This is bad math and is misinforming people. Um, in fact, uh, a few days after this tweet came up, out, I went to the Miss Cannon Center website and I saw that they'd actually pulled down their election prediction. So they, they listened to him, I guess. Uh, you can still find it in Google Archives, though, if you want it as a teaching example. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through the error that Nate Silver is pointing out here, because it illustrates a larger statistical point. All right, I'm going to read through uh, their methodology now just quickly, and then I will illustrate it with pictures. So they say, ultimately, 16 states uh, were projected as swing states, states or districts. So swing states uh, means that the outcome is uncertain. So their model is actually only based on 16 states. And this is because for most states in America, we're pretty sure who's going to win that state. So for example, um, we're pretty sure that California and New York are both going to go to Joe Biden. Uh, in fact, if Biden doesn't win California and New York, that will mean that something crazy has happened in the election I am not putting it past 2020, but uh, let's just say that we can hopefully safely put New York and California in the Biden column. And so what this model does is it says, let's you know assume that those states where we're pretty darn sure what's going to happen, we're just going to put uh, the votes uh, for Biden, that's 203, and the votes, votes for Trump, that's 122. We're just going to assume that those are safe votes from non-swing states. And we're only going to focus on the states where things are uncertain. 
They then say, therefore, we can consider that there are 65,536 or two raised to the 16th different scenarios in which the electoral map can potentially unfold with some scenarios more likely than others. So what they're saying here is every state has two possible outcomes, Biden wins or Trump wins. And there are 16 states. So that gives us two raised to the 16th different ways the electoral map can unfold. Each of these scenarios was evaluated using what can be referred to as a multiple coin toss technique. For example, if you have two coins, the probability of both of those coins landing on heads is 50% times 50% or 25%. You can then calculate the overall chance of different scenarios by multiplying probabilities. And this technique was used on a large scale to calculate the probability and the respective electoral college outcome for each of the 65,000 scenarios. All right, so now I'm gonna illustrate that with some pictures. So what the Miss Cannon Center did is they essentially flipped a weighted coin for each of the swing states. So for example, Pennsylvania is a swing state with 20 electoral college votes. Current polling, at least when I made these slides, I made these slides maybe two weeks ago, so the polls may have slightly changed, but at that point, um, the probability of a Biden win was somewhere around 80%. The probability of a Trump win was around 20%. So the Niskanen Center flips a weighted coin with an 80% chance of heads and a 20% chance of tails. If you get heads, Biden wins. If you get tails, Trump wins. Now, where did that 80% probability come from? In fact, the Niskanen Center did not publish the probabilities that they used in their model. So what I did is I went to 538.com. They published probabilities for each state, so I just used their probabilities. Where do those probabilities actually come from? Well, they come primarily from the current polling data. I think 538.com may throw a few other things in the soup to come up with those probabilities there, but they're primarily determined by polling data. Um, and so the Pennsylvania polls, uh, for example, at the time I made these slides, had Biden up 5.1% ahead of Trump. But that doesn't mean that Biden that polls have error. And so if you take into the account the fact that you know that there's going to be some error, there's some chance that those polls are off and could be off by quite a bit, um, that, that gives you an 80% chance of a, a Biden win. That's the idea. The Niskanen Center then flips a weighted coin for another swing state, say Florida, which has 29 electoral votes. Uh, when I made these slides, 538.com had Biden at about 60%. Um, now we have four possible outcomes in the election, right? Four branches to this tree. But then we can do this again for a third swing state, Ohio, which has 18 electoral college votes. It's pulling a little closer between Biden and Trump. Now we have eight possible outcomes in the election. Uh, and I'm going to stop at three states. And that's all that's going to fit on my slide. If I did all 16 states, my tree here would have 65,000 branches. I can't fit that on the slide. And uh, so I can get the idea with just three states. So I'm going to stop at three states to, just to give you the idea. All right, so now we have eight possible outcomes, right? Two raised to the third possible ways uh, these states can unfold. So Biden, for example, could win all three states. If he does, he would get 67 electoral votes. The Niskanen Center calculates the probability of that particular outcome by multiplying the probabilities of the coin flips together. So 0.8 times 0.6 times 0.53 gives you 25.4% chance of that outcome. He also, Biden could also win Pennsylvania and Florida, but lose Ohio. He would get 49 electoral votes and he would add a probability of 0.8 times 10.47, which is 22.6%. Or Biden could win Pennsylvania and Ohio, but lose Florida. That would give him 38 electoral votes. They put that at a 17% chance and so on. Uh, of course, you know, they have to do this across 65,000 branches. So we are certainly not gonna do this by hand. You're going to implement this calculation in a computer. And so I wanted to recreate their method. So what I did is I used what's called a computer simulation to do this calculation in the computer for me. All right, so let me explain how a computer simulation works. Um, so what I'm doing essentially is I am running a large number of virtual elections in the computer. And the idea here is I want to see how frequently different electoral college outcomes occur. And that will tell me their probability, how likely they are. So what I start doing is I first run one virtual election in the computer. And to do this, I have the computer flip a virtual coin for each swing state. And that virtual coin is weighted by the probability of a Biden win. So for example, for Pennsylvania, 
I weight the coin by 80%. Uh, I have the computer flip that coin virtually. If I get heads, find wins. If I get tails, trump wins. And then I do this for all of the swing states, and I add up all the electoral votes from those swing states. I then add in the votes from the non-swing states, and I come up with an election result. So I do this once, but then I repeat this a really large number of times. And I did this a million times in my computer. Why a million? It's totally arbitrary. That is just a really big number that doesn't hang my computer. So this simulation will run in under a second in my computer on my laptop. Then I can look at how frequently did different outcomes occur, and that is their probability. All right, to make this a little bit more concrete, I'm now showing you just uh, the result of one of those virtual elections from my simulation out of a million. And I should say I used um, 17 swing states or districts in my model. The Discan Center 18. Uh, I used the probabilities uh, from 538.com. I don't know exactly what probabilities they use. So we may get slightly different results, but you'll see in a minute it's very close. So what do I do? Well, for example, Alaska has three electoral votes. Current polling has Biden at about a 22% chance of a win. So I have the computer flip a virtual coin with a 22% chance of heads. And in this iteration of my simulation, in this virtual election, I get a tails. And actually, Biden loses. Um, I then flip a virtual coin for Arizona. Uh, a 64% chance of heads. And in this case, uh, Biden wins. I get a heads. And I do this for all of the swing states. And then I add up the electoral college total from this particular iteration of my simulation. I get 108. I add that to the 203 that's you know, safely in his column, and I get that he gets 311 electoral votes and wins the election. But then I do this a large number of times. I do this a million times, and I see um, how it sorts out in all of those million times, and I'm going to plot it in a histogram so you can look at that distribution. What I'm showing you here on the right-hand side of my screen, that is the histogram from my simulation. And what you'll notice is that it looks an awful lot right? And getting very similar results to that. Um, I get slightly different results, a slightly lower probability of a Biden win because, again, I use slightly different parameters in my model. But I get a bell curve shape, and I get a very high probability of a Biden win. Um, and you can see that most of the time in those simulations, we got somewhere between, two, you know, Biden got somewhere between 270 and, you know, 400 electoral votes. So putting him in a very high chance of a win. All right. But as uh, Nate Silver already pointed out, this approach has a problem. So this multiple coin toss technique that they use relies on an assumption. So in probability, we have this rule that says that if you have two events and you want to calculate the probability of both of those events occurring, like when I flip two coins, I get two heads. That's what we call a joint probability. You can calculate that probability by multiplying together the probability of each individual event occurring separately, what we call the marginal probability, that is the probability of getting a heads on the first coin toss times the probability of getting a heads on the second coin toss. That works if the two events in question are independent. So of course, coin flips are independent, right? If I flip a coin and I get a heads, that doesn't change my probability of getting a heads on the next coin flip. But state-to-state -state results in an election are absolutely not independent. They are highly correlated. So for example, if Trump wins Michigan, this greatly increases the probability that he is going to win Wisconsin. And this is because polling errors are correlated. So if the polls have underestimated a Michigan win for Trump, they have almost certainly underestimated a Wisconsin win for him. And uh, so what this means is we can't simply multiply the probabilities of the different states together to get the overall probability. If we do that, we're gonna get the wrong answer. And this is some of what went wrong in those election forecasts in 2016. So what I'm showing you here now is this table is from a paper that did a post-mortem of the 2016 election forecasts. And uh, the data in this table come from the New York Times, uh, data that were published in the New York Times the night before the 2016 presidential election. And so the New York Times, the night before the election, had Clinton up two percentage points in Florida, seven percentage points in Michigan, one percentage point in North Carolina, five in Pennsylvania, six in Wisconsin. As it turns out, Trump actually won all six of those states. And you can see the margins by which he won uh, in the slide here. 
Uh, for example, in Florida, the pre-election polls had Clinton up two points and Trump won by 1.2 points. In others, the pre-election polls had overestimated the Clinton win in Florida by 3.2 percentage points. And you can see that, in fact, in all six of these states, the polls overestimated for Clinton, and they all overestimated by very similar amounts. This means that the polling errors were not independent. They are highly correlated. You get very similar errors in all of the states. Whatever went wrong in the polls in Michigan also went wrong in the polls in Wisconsin. And we can speculate as to what might happen. You know, maybe uh, pollsters didn't reach Trump voters. Maybe uh, Trump voters uh, lied to pollsters about their voting intentions. Maybe Trump voters were more likely to show up on election day. Could be all, all of those things, right? But whatever went wrong, it was off, you know, by similar amounts and in the same direction across all of these states. So what happened in a lot of the 2016 election forecasts in those models? is that they did not account for the fact that uh, states might be correlated. Or if they did account for it, they inadequately accounted for that correlation. So what I did next is I tweaked my simulation just a little bit to focus on the polling data rather than the probabilities of a Biden win. And remember, those probabilities came directly from the polling data. So uh, these are really just two different ways of looking at the same thing. And so you can see the results in my simulation here. It's basically the same as before. This doesn't really change anything, but I'm just looking at it a slightly different way. And so what I'm doing now, though, is instead of randomly flipping a coin for each state, I'm instead randomly generating a polling error for each state. And uh, I'm assuming that there is some kind of like plausible distribution of plausible polling errors here. So maybe the polling errors could range anywhere from negative 20% to positive 20%. And negative 20% would mean that they are underestimating for Biden by 20%. Positive 20% would mean that they are overestimating for Biden by 20%. <clears throat> and I'm <clears throat> going to assume in my distribution here that like very large polling errors are less likely than smaller polling errors. But rather than uh, flipping a coin now to determine the outcome of each state, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to uh, throw a virtual dart onto this dartboard, which represents the distribution of my polling errors here. And um, that uh, polling error that comes up that I randomly generate will actually determine the outcome of that state. So for example, when I made these slides, Biden was polling up 5.1% ahead of Trump in Pennsylvania. But then in my simulation, what I'm going to do is have the computer you know, throw this virtual dart come up with a polling error for Pennsylvania. And in this iteration, I get that the polling error in Pennsylvania is a 6% overestimate. What does that mean? Well, that means that Trump is going to win the election in Pennsylvania by 0.9 percentage points. And so I'm then, in that iteration of the simulation, going to put Pennsylvania in Trump's column. <clears throat> and then, of course, I do this for every swing state. Um, and that gives me an election outcome. And then I do this a million times as before. And I should note that in my distribution, I have just as many negatives as positives. So I am assuming that polling errors are equally likely to help Biden or Trump here. This is still treating the states as independent, though. So I am throwing a random dart for each state separately. These polling errors are still uncorrelated. That's why I get basically the same result as before. But this makes it easier, this uh, redo of my simulation makes it easier for me then to incorporate correlated polling errors. So that's what I do next. I changed my simulation to make the polling errors in certain states correlated. So for example, I thought maybe Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, Florida, and Minnesota might be correlated because they were correlated in 2016. I gave them a correlation of coefficient of 0.8, which is very high. I also thought maybe Texas, Arizona, and Nevada might go together. So I gave them um, a high correlation. I should uh, give a disclaimer here to say that um, I just made these correlation structures up. I, this is not based on any empirical data. So uh, I am not trying to accurately uh, predict the election here. I just want to show you the effect of adding correlation into the model, how that changes the results. <clears throat> so this is just meant for illustration. Yeah, it's important to keep in mind now that the polling errors are still equally likely to help Trump or Biden. So my distribution has just as many negatives as positive, just as many errors that help Biden as that help Trump. 
So I am not building in any systematic error for Trump here. But the fact of adding correlation still greatly changes this model. So now here I'm showing you the results of my It's a lot different than before. So I no longer have a nice bell-shaped uh, curve. Uh, and the probability of a Biden win drops precipitously you know, to 87.7%. So just the fact of adding correlation to this simulation, it actually helps the underdog here. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, think about when we were modeling the states as independent coin flips or independent dark rows. You had to have a lot of flukes in a row occur in order for Trump to win, right? You had to have a whole, whole bunch of coins that were weighted towards heads, you know, come up tails in a row. So that creates very few paths to a Trump win. If you have correlated states, that means now you just kind of need one fluke, one odd coin flip, or one odd dart throw. And that moves all of the states with it, and that now opens up many more paths to a Trump win. So just for comparison's sake now, I'm, I'm showing you the uh, election prediction from 538.com. Again, I, I made these slides a few weeks ago, so this was maybe from early October. If you look at the bottom panel there, they have modeled the election outcome in terms of electoral votes for, for Biden. And you can see it looks pretty similar to the uh, election prediction that I just showed you. It's, again, this more spread out distribution, uh, not bell-shaped. And similarly, The Economist uh, has an election prediction that kind of has a similar shape, more spread out, not bell-shaped, some paths to a Trump win. So both of these models that I just showed you are actually accounting for correlation between states. All right, the final case study that I want to discuss today, I want to illustrate the ideas of confounding and statistical adjustment. And I'm going to use vitamin D as an example. So you may have seen some headlines recently related to vitamin D. There have been some studies claiming that vitamin D can reduce your risk of coronavirus. Um, actually, in the last two decades, there have been a lot of headlines about vitamin D. So uh, there's been everything, you know, tons of studies making claims about vitamin D. There's been studies saying vitamin D can prevent dementia, that it can prevent cancer, that it can fight depression. Um, in fact, for almost any condition or disease you can think of, I bet you there is a study out there somewhere saying that vitamin D improves that condition. Um, I happen to be, though, largely a vitamin D skeptic, and, and that's because um, I do think that vitamin D is important in bone health. There's good data to support that. But the data for everything else is a lot murkier, and that's because most of these vitamin D studies have been observational studies. And vitamin D has a problem. It is a highly confounded variable. So um, people who have healthy ha uh, habits, people who are healthy in general, they tend to have higher vitamin D levels. But that doesn't mean that the vitamin D causes them to be healthier. It's maybe just a marker of good health. And I'm now going to discuss my favorite study to illustrate this particular point. And this is a study that came out uh, two years ago. It claimed that your vitamin D levels could help improve your aerobic fitness. And it got a lot of media attention. It had an alt metric score of 320, which is considered very high. I'm showing you some headlines here. If you look at the second news article there, it has a subheading and it says, the sunshine vitamin is important for bone and brain health, but new research suggests it can also make the lungs and heart more efficient as well. So they are actually making a causal claim about vitamin D aerobic fitness. And if you read further in that news article, it says the study notes that vitamin D could potentially affect cardiovascular fitness in several ways. For starters, the nutrient has been shown to boost the production of muscle protein and aid in calcium and phosphorus transport on a cellular level. It may also affect the body's makeup of fast twitch muscle fibers, suggesting that vitamin D may improve aerobic fitness, the authors wrote. So they are clearly trying to make a causal claim. They're trying to explain how, at a biological level, vitamin D could actually directly boost your aerobic fitness levels. Um, and it's funny because a lot of times we blame journalists for overhyping scientific results in the news. I think, though, a lot of the times it's not really the journalists. It's actually the authors who have overhyped the results in their paper. And a lot of times it's simply the journalists parroting what the authors have said. And that's certainly the case here. 
All right, so what was this study? The study used data from the National Health and Nutrition Survey, NHANES. And this is a study that periodically surveys a representative sample of the health of the U.S. population. The researchers here specifically took data on young people who had had both their vitamin D levels and their VO2 max levels measured through NHANES because they wanted to look at the association of those two variables. All right, I'm showing you table one from the paper. I'm going to zoom in on this in a minute. Uh, but just keep in mind that the researchers divided the participants into quartiles by their vitamin D levels. All right, zooming in now. Um, as expected, because they formed these groups based on their vitamin D levels, the vitamin D levels then, of course, go up across the quartiles um, uh, because these groups are formed based on vitamin D. So for example, the lowest quartile of vitamin D, the average vitamin D level was 35 nanomoles per liter. In the highest quartile of vitamin D, the average vitamin D was 83 nanomoles per liter. They then look to see do the VO2 max levels differ in these different, different vitamin D groups? And they did indeed find that the average VO2 max increases as you go up across the vitamin D groups. And so, for example, if you look at the first quartile compared to the second quartile, lowest vitamin D group compared to the second lowest vitamin D group, you see about a two unit increase in VO2 max. I'm rounding here, but it's roughly 38 to 40. If you go from the first quartile to the third quartile, it's roughly a three unit increase in VO2 max. And if you go from the first quartile to the fourth quartile, it's roughly a four unit increase in VO2 max. I am rounding very heavily here, but I just want to make easy numbers to remember. But as I alluded to before, uh, vitamin D is related to a lot of other variables. And you can see this if you look through the rest of table one. So for example, we know that obesity is a risk factor for low vitamin D. Uh, obesity impairs your ability to absorb vitamin D. And you can see that here, the low vitamin D group had an average BMI of 29.1, whereas the high vitamin D group was much lower, an average BMI of 25.9. Vitamin D is also strongly related to skin pigment. And so the more pigment you have in the skin, that blocks the absorption of vitamin D. And sunlight is very important in the body for the production of vitamin D. So not surprisingly, the high vitamin D group here had many more white participants than the low vitamin D group. People with certain health problems also tend to have lower vitamin D levels. And so, uh, for example, uh, these are young people, so there aren't that many people in the sample with diabetes and hypertension. But if you look, there are more people in the low vitamin D groups of those conditions compared with the high vitamin D groups. All right, I'm now showing you the main figure from this paper. So let me orient you to this figure a bit. So first of all, on the x-axis, we have VO2 max. The upper panel, these are the unadjusted results. The bottom panel, that's the adjusted result. And what the authors did is they compared the mean or average VO2 max in the higher vitamin D groups compared with the lowest vitamin D group. So the reference group here is that first quartile or the lowest vitamin D group. The squares that you see on the plot those represent the difference in means between the different quartiles compared with quartile one. So for example, as we already pointed out, if you look at this top panel here, if you compare quartile two to quartile one, quartile two is about two units higher in VO2 max, if you look down the x-axis here. Quartile three is about three units higher in VO2 max compared to the first quartile, and quartile four was about four units higher, as we already saw in table one. What they did is they fit a linear regression model here. So the outcome is VO2 max. The predictor is your vitamin D groups. The beta coefficients from that model represent the mean differences between those groups. So again, quartile 2 compared to quartile 1, the difference is about 2. Quartile 3 compared to quartile 1, the difference is about 3. And the fourth quartile, uh, the difference from quartile 1 was about 4. That's before we take into account confounders. What they did next, though, is they adjusted their models for potential confounders, age, sex, race, BMI, hypertension, the variables that they had available in NHANES. And what you see is in the adjusted models, there is a smaller effect size. So the differences in the means between the groups gets closer to zero. And you can see this in all of the groups, they, the, the differences shrink. The beta coefficients become smaller, they become closer to zero. And this is what you expect to see if there is confounding. Once you account for the confounding, the effect sizes get smaller. 
So there is confounding going on here. Uh, but what the authors did is that they looked at these results and they said, well, um, the difference between quartile two and quartile one is no longer statistically significant. You can see that the confidence interval now crosses zero for that group. But quartile three and quartile four remain significantly higher than quartile one. So they use this finding to argue that therefore vitamin D affects your VO2 max levels. And they spun a whole causal story about this, right? They came up with all sorts of logical explanations how this is working at the biological level. The journalists in the news article I showed you earlier actually already did a really good job of summarizing those, so I, I'm not going to read those. Um, but there is an elephant in the room here, right? There is a major confounder that we have not accounted for here. Um, they were not able to account for this confounder because they did not have the variable available to them in NAs. So if you think about what are the things that affect vitamin D levels? Well, the major one is your exposure to sunlight. But if you then think about what are the things that affect VO2 max? Well, the major one is your physical activity level. If you are more physically active, you're going to have better aerobic fitness. But where does most physical activity occur? Well, it occurs outdoors. So people who are going outdoors to exercise, they are going to have better VO2 max. But guess what? They're also getting exposed to the sun, so they are also going to have better vitamin D levels. And I believe that this can probably explain the association that we are seeing in this study. Now, the authors do mention this. Way down at the bottom of the discussion se section, they say, uh, the results were not adjusted for vitamin D intake, diet, or physical activity, both of which may have an effect on the observed association. The problem is that that little sentence buried down in the bottom of the discussion, to me, that's the whole story. The most plausible explanation of the association we're seeing here is due to physical activity, not because you know vitamin D somehow affects your phosphorus levels and your fast twitch muscles. Physical activity is a more plausible explanation for what we're seeing here. And this just gets to the larger problem of unmeasured and residual confounding. So I think a lot of the vitamin D studies, we're going to find out later, the, uh, the uh, associations we were seeing were really just due to confounding. Um, and that's because other studies, again, were observational studies. And in, when authors are presenting observational studies, they often say things like, well, we adjusted for all these confounders. And the implication is that you know, since you adjusted for them, you don't have to worry about them anymore. But st statistical adjustment is not a panacea. Just because uh, you've done some statistical adjustment doesn't mean you've taken care of all confounding. For confounders, we haven't measured, like physical activity in this particular example. But it's important to also realize that even when a confounder is in included in the model, that doesn't mean you have perfectly taken care of it. Um, there's always what we call residual or leftover confounding. And this occurs because you can only perfectly mathematically adjust the weight for something if you have measured it and modeled it perfectly. We rarely are able to do that with confounders, right? I mean, think about physical activity. We often measure the Did you do a lot or a little physical activity? Well, if we've measured it crudely, we cannot perfectly adjust for it, which is going to create some leftover or residual confounding, which can create spurious associations. All right, I'm going to wrap up here uh, to leave some time for questions, but I'll just point out a few further resources. So I do teach the Medical Statistics Certificate Program for Stanford Online. I'll say a few more words about that program in a minute. I also write a column uh, on statistics for the journal Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. I have a number of different uh, columns on different specific statistical topics, and I try to write those in a reader-friendly way. As to the certificate program, this is a three-course program. I do teach programming in either SAS or R. You are not required to have any previous programming experience. MedStats 1 covers things like uh, descriptive statistics and measures of disease, risk, and association, kind of similar to the COVID example I did today. MedStats 2 covers probability, inference, and simulation, my personal favorite, similar to the election example that I did today. And MedStats 3 covers specific statistical tests and regression analysis, similar to the vitamin D example that I talked about today. All right, so I'm now going to pass this back to Jackie to answer uh, any questions that you might have. OK, so a few questions, Kristen, that have come in. We'll start with um, your, um, your slides regarding the 
polling data and the polling statistics. Okay. Um, a few questions here. First, why do a million sil simulations rather than calculate 65,000 probabilities if the purpose is to try to replicate the methodology? Uh, yeah, I, so uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't actually know exactly how the Niskanen Center ran their calculation. I suspect that they did a simulation too because I can tell sort of from the histogram that they presented, so that's my guess. Um, that's the easiest way to calculate probabilities in a computer is just to run a big simulation. Um, then you don't have to think about the math. Run it many times and you see what happens. And so actually writing out those 65,000 different combinations is going to be harder than just uh, flipping a virtual coin a million times. So I tend to solve a lot of probability problems actually with a simulation. That's my first instinct because <laughs> uh, it tends to be easier than doing it out mathematically. Great question. Perfect. So um, why does an error in predicting a win in Michigan increase the likelihood that there is an error in predicting the win for Wisconsin? That's a great question. So remember, all of these predictions are based on polling data. Remember, those probabilities were basically just a function of the polling data. And uh, what happened in 2016 is that a lot of the polls were off. And it wasn't like they were off randomly. They were all off in the same direction. Um, and so why would that occur? Well, uh, there's nothing you know, sort of isolated or special about the polling in Michigan that's going to be different about the polling in Wisconsin. Michigan and Wisconsin also happen to be states with very similar demographics, very similar similar electorates. Uh, so, if the poll that you know the people who are polling in Michigan uh, get one answer, it's probably likely the people polling in Wisconsin it might even be some of the same groups, right? That administer these polls across different states. It's very likely that there's errors in one, they're going to be off by kind of similar amounts in the other. And you saw this in the data I showed you from the New York Times. Um, they were really all off by very similar amounts in the same direction. And that's just because whatever goes wrong in Michigan, highly likely the same thing is going to go wrong in Wisconsin. I mean, I mentioned some of the things, you know, the, the pollsters might be not reaching certain voters and they may not be waiting in their models, uh, the, you know, how, who's likely to come to the polls and, and things like this. Okay, so the next question is, um, are you supposing that the probability of those errors are uniformly distributed, or are you using some other distribution? That is such a great question. <laughs> so um, for the purposes of this little illustration, I wasn't too fussed about how to model these. But just for fun, because I'm curious about these things, I tried it both ways. And so um, it depends on the range of polling errors that I allow. But basically, I can get exactly the same result if I choose uniform with a certain range as if I choose a T distribution uh, with a certain range. Now, I actually ended up in the ones I showed you, I used the T distribution. Uh, that's what 538.com says they use. So, you know, I sort of tried to mimic theirs. Um, but actually, just out of curiosity, I did it both ways. And it doesn't make a huge difference as long as it, the, uh, the standard deviations in the polling error and the range uh, end up being roughly the same from those two distributions. So, yeah, you can do it both ways, actually, interestingly enough. The, the second question here is how could you, um, what could you do to account for the potential residual confounding even for those variables that you did um, include in the regression model? Yeah, so that is a great question. It, it, this is the problem with statistics. It's really hard to know when you're wrong, right? You did one study. <laughs> and just from that one study, what tells you that you're wrong? Well, a lot of times we actually don't know. Um, so we have to always just keep in the back of our minds when we're interpreting results that there's the possibility of residual confounding. Um, and there are some things, though, we can do to try to get at it from a particular study. Um, so one thing is people have done simulations to show that, for example, if you're modeling something with a binary outcome, that usually uh, residual confounding is only going to cause spurious associations that are so big. That is, you're not going to get an odds ratio of two purely due to residual confounding. Usually, it's bounded in these simulations somewhere between like an odds ratio of 0 0.6 and 1.6. So if you get odds ratios that are much bigger outside of that range, it's unlikely that they're entirely uh, explained by residual confounding. So that's one thing. Some people have done, you know, statisticians have done modeling simulations to try to get at like how big of an effect, how, how much off could you be? And you're somewhat limited when it comes to residual confounding, not as much limited when it comes to unmeasured confounding. We do that. Well, you know, if your sam uh, your effect sizes are really small, you might say to the reader, "Hey, you know, these are within the range that you might expect to see due to residual confounding." You can also do some modeling yourself 
for an individual study, we often do what are called sensitivity analyses. So you can try to, to say, well, what if there had been you know, this much measurement error or that much measurement error? You can try to factor that in and get a sense. Um, how much could residual confounding be in play here? So people will sometimes do that. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, try to have some kind of uh, control analysis. And I, I really like this idea, actually. One of my favorite studies to teach from is there was a study that came out a number of years ago that was looking at red meat eating. And it found that people who ate red meat had a higher mortality than people who didn't eat so much red meat. Um, but one of the outcomes that they looked at was death by accidents and injuries. And they found just as much of an increased risk of death from accidents and injuries as they did from cancer and heart disease. And it's very hard to come up with a plausible causal story of how red meat eating might increase your risk of like getting shot by a gun or getting in a car accident. And so that actually serves as a nice control in that study because it shows you that probably what you're picking up is residual confounding. People eat a lot of red meat are riskier in many other ways. And so having a nice control analysis like that where there's no plausible causal explanation can also be a really good way to get at that. But you never know for sure, right? These are all just ways of guessing at. So the next question is, would confounding be reduced by multivariate analysis? Yeah, great question. So what I showed you in that vitamin D example is they had done a multivariable analysis. So they had done a regression where they put a bunch of other variables in the model in order to adjust for them. And so this trying to account for confounding. I think sometimes we get um, you know, overly complacent though, and we think like, oh, we, we put things in a statistical model, we did our multivariable model, we adjusted for it, so we don't have to worry about confounding anymore. And it's not quite that clean. As I said, I think a lot of times um, we, we feel <laughs> overly confident after a statistical adjustment, whereas there might still be some either unmeasured or residual confounding. So it's not a panacea, but that is one of the common techniques that we use to at least try to start to get at confounding, yeah. Okay, and is there an easy and quick way to spot these statistical errors? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, and so um, use common sense. <laughs> so this is the thing that I, I think, um, even if you are not, even if you're not a statistician, a lot of these errors you can actually spot just using common sense, thinking through the problem. So for example, the physical activity in vitamin D example, I think if you think about have vitamin D, what are the things that cause you to have aerobic fitness? You don't need to know necessarily a ton about statistics to realize that those things are going to be linked. And that sounds a lot more plausible than like, you know, the vitamin D changes your phosphorus in your cells and that somehow boosts your aerobic activity. So just using common sense is a really good, uh, a good first principle, a good place to start. Another thing you can do is look at figures, uh, pictures in, your, in the paper. Often there's things that you can see in a picture that's kind of buried if they just give you the results of a statistical model. So paying attention to those pictures, making sure the pictures match the actual model. Um, looking for red flags in a paper. So I did an earlier uh, webinar on how to be a statistical detective and I went through some, some red flags you can look for in a paper, like things don't add up. <laughs> it, you know, sloppiness that might indicate that the authors haven't thought through things as carefully as they should have. Um, and so just, you know, kind of keeping your, your guard up, not trusting that just because the author said they took care of it, that's the case. Being a little bit skeptical, interpreting things with your skeptical hat on, and that's what a lot of in my teaching I try to get my students to do is just you know, use common sense and be skeptical and don't think that the authors are more of an authority than you. You you have, you know, using your, your common sense can, uh, can spot a lot of these uh, potential issues. And so a follow-up question to that is, um, how can people practice um, spotting statistical errors in, in papers or in the media? Um, do you have any strategies or tools that they can use? Uh, sure. So I'll, I'll refer you to the, to the webinar I did on how to be a statistical detective. There were some very specific tools I went through there uh, that could um, that were easy to use that could, you could use to spot errors in papers, and um, I just spent a lot of time doing that. Um, if you're a researcher and you have the opportunity to review papers, especially if you're a young researcher, say yes to those opportunities to review papers, because in going through other papers, um, it's a really good practice when you're kind of scrutinizing them carefully to look for these kinds of uh, red flags. Um, and you know, it, this is the kind of thing you develop with experience. Uh, if you have your skeptical hat on there to start <laughs> um, and 
Um, you know, you learn a few statistical principles, um, take courses in statistics, then then you can be a statistical detective, and, and um, you can kind of go into papers with that skeptical view. If you're reading the news and you have the opportunity to go and pull the original paper and look carefully at that original paper, that's often a good way to, to scrutinize things from the news. Let's go back to the original paper and see, did that? Did it really show that? And if we can't control all the confounding variables, then a large part of the studies are actually inaccurate and we have no way to know answers to many questions. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so yes, I mean, you know, we you have to be careful with observation. Studies. You have to keep in the back of your mind that confounding could be an issue. You want to read those studies carefully. How well did they adjust for confounding? Did they take into account major things like physical activity in this particular design? Um, and of course, all of science is an accumulation of evidence. So we never just want to look at one study and say, well, this study found that vitamin D improves dementia, and therefore the question is answered. We need to look across many studies across replication to really become confident in a lot of these associations. And things like vitamin D, we were hoping you know, that eventually somebody does a randomized trial and we might get a better answer from a randomized trial. Perfect. Okay, and um, last question um, actually had to do with <laughs> your last response is if there had been a systematic review done on um, vitamin D, um, and VO2 um, causal relationships that adjust for vitamin D intake and physical activity. Right, so I mean, systematic reviews, meta-analyses are great because they try to pool the evidence across a lot of different studies. And so you're hoping that by doing that, you are, um, you know, you're getting a better estimate of the effect. You have to be a little careful though, because if all of the studies done were um, observational studies and you're pooling all these observational studies, it could be that there's systematic error, right? The, the same error that affects one study might affect another study. So in doing a review like that, if you really wanted to look at vitamin D and aerobic fitness, hopefully you'd be very careful to only include studies where they had carefully accounted for physical activity, for example. Um, so you have to keep in mind all these same biases might be present in many studies. So a meta-analysis or systematic review could simply replicate the, the, the systematic error across many studies. Um, so that's where being careful about what studies you include in your review can be very helpful. Perfect. Okay, well, I think that's all of the questions that we have time for today. Thank you so much, Kristen. This was a great webinar and very informative. Um, we just want to let everyone know um, that uh, Kristen's medical statistics program is available on Stanford online. Um, you'll see a, a button on your screen there if you'd like to learn more about this program um, and enroll. It will take you to the program page to learn more. Um, thank you again, Kristen, for the really informative webinar. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, everyone.